So good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Brandon Kyle, Director of Alumni and Family Engagement here at Pittsburgh College. Um, welcome back to another special presentation of Stay at Home with Pittsburgh College Art Galleries. As always, we have some familiar faces with us today, which is always exciting. Uh, but if you're joining us for the first time, we so appreciate you uh, tuning in this afternoon. This original collaboration with the Office of Alumni and Family Engagement and the Pittsburgh College Art Galleries was created to try to find new and innovative ways to keep our community connected during times of social distancing. We're so pleased to bring you the next iteration of our series. We'll be highlighting the work of alumni artist Benjamin Godsell, a class of 2000, who will be exploring the realm of late 20th and early 21st century art. Each of our summer series lectures are facilitated by our multi-talented curator, Kira Ennis, who has been both the curator and director of Pittsburgh College Art Gallery since 2007. We continue to be incredibly grateful to her for her willingness to partner with our office and for uh, putting together these very special uh, series of talks. With that being said, I would like to introduce you to Kara Ennis. Hi, Brandon, and everybody here today. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, I'd like to thank you and the Office of Alumni and Family Engagement for partnering with us today and uh, last month and the month before and next month. Um, I'd also like to give a very special thanks to Chris Schnow, Exhibitions and Communications Manager at the College Art Galleries for his help in coordinating and promoting these events. And of course, a huge thanks to everybody here today for joining us. We're so happy to see you. Um, so far during the Stay at Home series, we've been featuring artists and filmmakers. Today, we have the great pleasure of connecting with Benjamin Godsill, who is a curator and art advisor based in New York. As Brandon said, Benjamin graduated from Pittsburgh in 2000 um, with a BA in Media Studies and went on to pursue his Master's in Media Studies at the New School, where he graduated in 2006. He continued his education at the Museum of American Art in the prestigious Whitney Independent Study Program in the curatorial section. He is a highly accomplished curator. From 2006 to 2012, he curated a number of important shows at the New Museum in New York, in addition to working on a number of independent projects uh, in Los Angeles, Dallas, Detroit, and also um, in Italy. Upon leaving the New Museum, he took up the position of Senior Specialist in Contemporary Art at Phillips Auction House, and then from there founded his own art advisory firm called Curatorial Services, which he now runs. Benjamin has worked with some of the most important contemporary artists circulating today, and is deeply knowledgeable about curating and the machinations of the art world, of which he will touch on in his talk. We're so thrilled to have him today. The conversation will last approximately 15 minutes. We'll be followed by 10 minutes of Q&A. If you'd like to ask something, uh, please send it to me um, in the chat and I will pass it along to Benjamin um, after his talk. Again, thank you so much, Benjamin. We're thrilled to welcome you here and back to Pizza. So please join me in giving Benjamin a huge hand. Thank you so much, Kiara, and I want to uh, give thanks to you and Brandon for setting this up, and especially to Christopher for walking me through. Uh, I'm not the most tech savvy of individuals, and he was instrumental in getting me this far, so hopefully we can continue on without too many snafus. Um, and I really like these presentations. It's actually interesting at this time of pandemic and this time of atomization and separatization uh, in our physical bodies. I've actually felt more connected to Pitzer and the Pitzer College art community through these and some other things than I have uh, in many years. So um, uh, I tend to be a glass half full kind of guy. So I, I want to thank you for providing all this great content while we uh, while we shelter in place at home and and uh, and kind of figure out where we are uh, as a world. Um, so I wasn't sure what I wanted to do today because I'm not an artist and I don't have anything that I make to show. Uh, I've curated a lot of shows um, and that's one facet, but I think a kind of timeline of my biography, biography in this particular moment, I'm not sure how, how interesting or how valuable that could be. Um, and as I was sitting trying to work out some notes, I kind of thinking to myself, ended up looking through my phone and looking through images. And so I go on to structure my talk this afternoon, uh, going through a little bit of my brain, both kind of what my life was like uh, beforehand uh, 
uh, professional life, what my professional life has been like in these past few moments, uh, including a project I've, I've worked on recently, uh, and maybe some thoughts about uh, any fundamental changes that this particular moment might have, although I'm trying to get too deep and leave that to people that are still in academia and kind of uh, focus on, on my part of the art world. I'm an art advisor now. Uh, I have a background as a curator. And I still do curate independent projects. Uh, it's something that gives me great joy, but my, my main uh, my main raison d'etre is, is working as a private curator for, for individuals and, and, and corporations. And what that means, in case anyone doesn't know, is that uh, I work with them to develop a, a program of acquisitions uh, of art. Um, and I work with people for the long term. Uh, it's not sort of decorating houses, although sometimes that comes into it, but it's really thinking about building collections, ideally for, for many years to come. And, and and, and thinking about the stewardship of, of those objects. And there is a financial component to it because uh, uh, a lot of the folks I work with um, spend a fair amount of money uh, on the things that I think are great ideas, that we think are great ideas together, great things to have. So at least having some awareness that, 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 that money is not free and, and protecting the value by, by really uh, only engaging in the acquisition of things that, that have a real gravitas, either intellectually or, or even sometimes in a financial way uh, and in the best of worlds and most often when this is true in the consonants and the place where those two things meet. So I'm gonna try and share my screen and, and show a little bit about what I do in the day to day, and what my life is like, and uh, let's, see if, uh, let's see if I'm able to, uh, to complete this uh, fairly easy task, I'm told. So with any luck, uh, you should be uh, taking a look at, uh, at a white screen right now. Um, and someone uh, that can talk, pipe up if this isn't working. But what I usually do is I usually uh, look at things. I spend a lot of my time in galleries in New York, uh, in Los Angeles, and, and really around the world, uh, going to shows from small galleries to major galleries um, and looking at things. I'm just going to come back. Uh, looking at things uh, out in the world. Um, and uh, it's really great. Uh, and small little galleries and kind of just seeing what is out there um, and attending gallery openings on occasion, kind of packed with people and, and oftentimes uh, dinners that take place uh, just after that. Uh, I spend a lot of time, uh, I'm lucky enough to spend a lot of time going to museums around the world and looking at shows for things that we might acquire or just artists that are interesting to the collections um, I work with. And really just in a sense, just really looking, just always being uh, around the world, look things. Um, this also includes attending art fairs uh, uh, around the world, oftentimes with clients or on my own. And art fairs are basically, if you've never been, large conventions uh, where people get together and buy and sell art. Uh, but it's also a great way just to see people and to trade in the information that um, is such an important part of the art world. Here we have what I call kind of queuing up to get into an art fair, which is sort of a Black Friday for the 1% and, and in amongst the booths talking and, and ideally, uh, hopefully discovering new things. Also attending auction previews. The auctions are where we sell uh, things on the secondary market or I, I'm more in, in the game of buying things on the secondary market. So attending the previews and attending the evening sales uh, and just either observing or, or bidding to attempt to acquire work on behalf of clients. And uh, with the acquisition of work comes the care and overseeing the transport of things and moving them uh, around the world between different locations. And uh, sort of the really, one of the really fun parts of my job, installing the work uh, after it's been acquired and working with all the great people on the ground that make these things happen. Cleaning work and just kind of the general care and feeding of things. And this is a, a video of a piece that was uh, was at the doctor's office, also receiving conservation of any works that are in collections I manage uh, and curate, um, which involves, frankly, more paperwork than I ever intended or wanted to uh, to have uh, my hand. And luckily, I have a lot of help with it. And oftentimes, it's uh, it's uh, a shit ton of emails, for lack of a better phrase, uh, that we do in cars and in the weird lobbies of budget European hotels. Um, but Underneath all this paperwork and stuff, I mean, the great things are moments when clients receive work that we've worked on together to acquire and place it, and they are happy. 
or in this case, went after a, a, a long acquisition and, uh, and shipping and installation process, we get to uh, activate work, such as the sculpture um, of Bruno Bischof Berger and his wife, Yaya Kasuma, by the Swiss American artist, Urs Fischer, which is a candle, which literally kind of is only activated, only works when it is engaged in the, in the physical act of entropy of dissolving or destroying itself. Uh, in addition to acquiring works for collections, I work with collectors to help them uh, help them help the world by placing works in the collections of museums. Uh, this is an Alice Corte piece, which was only joined the collection and here it is shown in American Museum, or helping to support artists realize projects. This is a project by Annika Yi uh, that we helped, uh, someone I work with helped the financial support uh, that took place at the last Venice Biennale. Um, but more than anything else, um, it means an awful lot of time traveling to places and very early mornings in airports in familiar and strange places, both. I'm just gonna unshare and come back to uh, back to you all. Hopefully everyone's still there and was able to see that, yes? Great, so that was the, uh, the first part and kind of what life was like in the before times. Um, and in some ways it's a slightly unsustainable, both ecologically and just kind of on personal time because it involves an awful lot of plane travel and the movement of large objects over places. And uh, then all of a sudden sort of the middle of March hit and that all stopped. Um, and there are no galleries really that are open unless some are beginning to open to go to. Um, not a lot of museums uh, are happening and uh, auctions have moved into a different sort of phase, which we'll check out in a second. Um, so I'm sitting at home and not seeing any of these things in real life and just uh, sort of looking at images. Um, but there's always kind of new models that emerge and the art market's been very much stuck in a very uh, technologically uh, kind of calcified state, at least the commercial art market. When I say that art, when I say the art world, I mean the commercial art market, the sort of things that trade at the higher level of international affairs. Um, and so we've seen some, I won't call them new models, but we've seen new waves of, 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 of commerce to happen. I mean, uh, uh, for all of its uh, innumerable faults, capitalism has a way of, of self-correcting in terms of at least continuing on and continuing to accrue capital. And so uh, the art market itself has found ways to continue to uh, sort of move on. So I'm gonna send you, if that was the before time, I'm gonna send you with the last um, kind of the, the pictures on my phone, either screenshots I've taken, or uh, images that I've saved uh, have sort of looked like in the present time. So let's see if we can do this not once, but twice. So despite uh, all of the many things happening, especially from March through to May or so in the world, uh, you know, uh, the world might be on fire, but art dealers are still going to try and buy art. And I don't consider myself an art dealer, but I certainly work hand in hand with uh, with some of the better ones around the world. And uh, they keep asking if people wanted to be a painting and uh, wanted to buy a painting. One of the first things we saw to emerge, and this is just kind of a quick search I did this morning uh, of my inbox, was for online viewing rooms, which is a super amorphous term, term but which kind of uh, summarizes a lot of what's been happening. Uh, at least in the art market for these past few months. And that's just like the quickest, uh, the quickest little, little search. And there's just thousands and thousands of things that fit that term, my Gmail. Um, so art fairs, which are places where people gather, where intelligence is shared, um, where sometimes new discoveries are made, but more often than not, just where commerce happens, where the transaction, the buy and sale of artworks takes place. Um, and one of the first art fairs to realize that it wasn't gonna take place was uh, the Hong Kong edition of Art Basel, which is, um, Always a really fascinating thing to see because you see an emergence of a new type of collector from a from a new, at least to the the Western art world, uh, kind of new background. Um, in any case, it was that that was going to happen. So they did these online viewing rooms, which are kind of like, I mean, it's just an online shopping platform um, to look at objects and um, without very much content uh, and without a lot of feedback. Um, but you know, super fun to sit on your couch. I mean, it was kind of the most comfortable art fair. I certainly. Um, woke up the latest and uh, and had to dress the least for. And uh, so it was just these kind of really just very static JPEGs. Sometimes you could put them in a room with like a, a kind of um, uh, sort of generic modernist piece of furniture for scale. Um, and most of the things that were able to be sold were, were at the lower prices, something like this, this uh, polka, which would have been quite a bit more. I'm not sure if they got rid of that. Um, in addition to art fairs, I think actually one of the more valuable things, but again, quite a static model that's been happening are what, um, 
all the art galleries, but especially the high-end art galleries have done, which are these online exhibitions. And here we have an example that just came into my inbox maybe yesterday or the day before of a, an online exhibition of new paintings by Kerry James Marshall. In addition to showing the work, this provides uh, semi-scholarly essays, video, background on the artist in this particular body of work, um, comp comps, uh, comp comparison examples from art history, um, in this case, it's a, it's a research project based on Audubon, who you just saw there. Um, but still a real static way to try and look at paintings that are, you know, north of $2 million. Um, but still kind of interesting and, 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 and good to see. Um, and auctions as well, when, uh, you know, the pure, the pure capitalist form of the art market, the uh, buying and selling with few strings attached, also went virtual. So here we have Ollie Barker from Sotheby's doing a fully virtual auction. Um, the virtual, this is in the New York sales room, I believe, with the, the phone bidders there with clients attached to them, you know, space the requisite six to 10 feet apart. Um, and, to, and to fairly good, uh, to fairly good results. Um, but it's not clearly a model that works forever. And it's certainly not, I wouldn't say innovative in the technological sense, but it allowed for things to happen. Um, things aren't happening at the same speed, but what it also allowed for, unfortunately, is that increasing trend of the commercial side of the artwork is a, a real bridge and, and, and every other aspect of American culture, I suppose, is a real bridge between the haves and the have nots. Uh, you see the bigger galleries, they don't only really can develop these things, but have the star artists that can draw someone's desirability to buy an artwork in good times or bad, um, while leaving uh, a lot of the smaller and really, uh, uh, truthfully, the mid-sized galleries behind. All these galleries are, are, are still paying the same uh, commercial rents, but you know, like, like so many other aspects uh, of the economy right now, unable to really transact. So the big galleries are able to kind of build these systems and have enough of a stable, desirable artist that, that they can kind of continue on this way a little bit, although a lot of the big galleries are also um, experiencing staff layoffs. And then the real small galleries that are a bit scrap scrappier, that are, are something akin to alternative spaces, um, or at least that's their, their closest cousin of the nonprofit art world, are able to continue on by, by keeping expenses low, having an owner uh, uh, who's also the, the only employee, um, things like this nature. But you know, during this time, while well, obviously the commercial art market's gradual fall, uh, the nonprofit art market and the, and, the, and the world writ large is kind of dealing with a, a real sea change in how we think about systems of oppression and a reckoning with the, the, the racist underpinnings of American culture. And that certainly stretches into the art world. And we're seeing a lot of hard questions being asked in museums about the type of people that work there and, and how people get jobs and just the amount of privilege that's engendered by those that have the choices to say what is on view. Now, of course, this is something that artists have been looking at forever. So looking through my phone, I had all these screenshots of works that kind of had occurred to me uh, in relation to this over the past little bit. So I thought it was important to share those as well if I'm giving you an insight to my brain. Of course, David Hammond's great in the hood, uh, worked by my friend Rashid Johnson, and. Uh, are really tough and I think uh, most illustrative contemporary artwork about America is, is this piece by Katie Noland. Uh, and then of course thinking about um, what types of moder uh, what types of monuments we might actually need uh, in this country uh, or how we should think about what uh, a public memorial or monument can be and is and why it exists. And there's a great piece by Kara Walker that was most recently, uh, which was made for and, and shown at the Turbine Hall at the, the Tate in London. And just always kind of thinking about, the, despite everything that's going on in the art world, just the kind of the loom of politics that, um, that you, even the commercial side that really kind of adds a, a, a cast a shadow over everything that we do. Um, so that's sort of what's been going on uh, for the main part in my professional life in terms of the art economy and the pandemic. And, and, and who thinks they have the answers of what will happen in regards to that um, really doesn't know. I certainly, if I had the answers, I wouldn't work for a living. But, you know, the, we're going to see a continuation of a separation between the, the, the mega galleries and the mega artists and probably the mega museums um, that can afford to weather this kind of storm, that can afford to um, kind of focus really on the things that sell, either the artists that sell or in terms of museums of the uh, the blockbuster types of shows you can help sell, whereas... Um, Perhaps there's the danger of more radical or even just alternative voices, um, both in the musicological level and in the commercial space, kind of disappearing. Um, uh, but this is not something that's new and not really, and not, not just caused by the COVID pandemic, but it's sort of an exasperation or an accelerant of themes that have been taking place uh, in the art world for a number of years. But um, where there's a will, there is a, there's sort of a way for good or ill. And one thing that we have seen is that if collectors aren't flying to fairs or to auctions 
or uh, driving uh, from the Upper East Side down to Chelsea to see uh, uh, gallery shows uh, or gallery pictures. Um, oops, sorry for that. Sorry, where was that? We are uh, we're seeing that uh, that galleries uh, uh, and spaces are more than willing to go to where those art collectors are, um, and so I'm on the eastern end of Long Island right now, and we have been inundated uh, with a lot of high end galleries and auction houses um, bringing their wares uh, and setting up little pop up uh, pop up galleries that are viewable by appointment only and, and with registration and masks and all that. Um, and that uh, was a meme that, that, that appealed to me. And I'm certainly guilty of that because I'm out here because I curated uh, a show uh, at a good friend's gallery out here called the Rental Gallery, um, called Friend of Ours. And in addition to kind of thinking about the meta things about the art market, one of the ways that I keep myself grounded or, or continue to kind of think about culture in a real uh, tangible way is by working on curating shows. In this case, a commercial show that took place uh, in downtown East Hampton that just closed uh, today, in fact. Uh, so here we see this little gallery. I just want to take you through, just show you some installation shots of kind of a small, modest show, but I think timely. Um, and it, it's timely in that it's really looking at veracity. And uh, we live in an age, at least for me, where the notion, not just of, 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 of what is true, but what is real, uh, is constantly humming in the background and you never know whether to believe your own lying eyes sort of thing. So it's a show that looks at that uh, obliquely through a series of artistic practices that uh, seem somehow unreal or in certain cases more real than reality itself um, and are very much connected to a notion of kind of a post a post uh, uh, kind of post photoshop moment we presume that everything has already been sort of fixed in post or photoshopped or changed when in fact sometimes those things are simply what they are um, at least in the artistic sense and so I just wanted to go through some specific works from the show before we open up for questions um, this is a work uh, by the artist Borna Samak. Uh, he's a collagist, but as opposed to using uh, news media to make his collages or other bits of material culture, he very specifically hones down on commercially available iron-on t-shirt decals. Um, and sometimes he'll use hundreds, uh, or in this case, sometimes he'll do a quite spare one that just includes two, and the sort of notion of collage that, and, and something that looks as though it was digitally created by the artist, but in fact is two, uh, is a very analog process that the artist has cut and combined. Um, or the artist Hugh Hayden, a uh, uh, New York based, but uh, Texas born and bred artist. Um, Hugh is of African descent and uh, is very interested in, in, in how culture is accrued and who has the authority or the permission to speak about what a culture is. This piece is titled Paula Dean. It's from a series of cast iron cookware uh, projects that he did. Um, this one here, is a, a, an African mask, obviously, and it's not a it's not a quote unquote authentic mask. It's a mask that he found in a store that um, you know has a, was only ever made uh, as a as perhaps a tourist trinket or, or or that way, but it's never actually part of culture. And he's affixed this to a cast iron pan and then uh, makes a sand casting, which in itself is a process that loses resolution. Um, this is a work by Mungo Thompson, and obviously it's quite familiar a stack of three uh, Amazon Prime packages uh, freshly delivered to the doorstep. In this case, while it looks like that, that's not what it is. It's actually um, cast bronze that has been painted with an, uh, an enamel paint. And uh, you can't see the details in this picture, I don't think. But each sticker has, a, a, has depth and density, and it really uh, feels the eye, honestly, until you touch it for the first time, you feel that cold metal and the hollow sound. Um, this notion of something that appears to be something and is, is yet something else. Um, or Anneke Yee, who's an artist I've worked with um, a lot in the past. Um, she's someone who's always thought about uh, uh, biology and virology and the natural world and this intersection, the, the ecological natural world's intersection with, with man. And, uh, and not in an adversarial way, but just in, a, in a, the facts speak as they are. So these are some, some different um, biological organisms that she has blown up in a, in a microscope and then made models of and casts. Um, and they are like things that exist in the real world, but they actually are not anything that exists in the world. They just have the feel of these, of these things. Um, or the artist Faharo Kusami, who makes these wonderful photographs um, that look like they're Photoshop, or at least to me, look unreal uh, or, or somehow uh, touched up, but, are, but actually uh, snaps of reality is this guy in a flower shop. And I want to say guitar, but I might have the, I might have the city wrong. 
um, or another Las Vegas artist, uh, Sarah Gomez, um, who uh, makes these incredibly detailed things that look like something. I mean, they look like a piece of wall with stickers affixed. Uh, this one, at least to me, looks like a jail or a prison wall. And these, these painted stickers, again, have a real a thickness and a, and a feeling of presence and, and the way that the, they're peeled back. Um, but it's really just um, oil paint and canvas and a, and a bit of putty to give it the, to give it the texture in certain spots. Or the artist Alex Israel, who here is kind of playing with the notion of awards, and he's someone who often looks at uh, at the image creation industry uh, and culture creation industry in Los Angeles. In this case, he took a, one of the molds for the Oscar statuette. Uh, he made a mold of that mold, uh, a negative, and then made these beautiful painted bronze sculptures that that weigh a ton, that uh, kind of look like the negative space that would surround what is usually usually the award. Um, or Josh Klein, uh, a really interesting artist that, unfortunately, this I must have portrait mode on, but you can see the, the face of the character. It's a waiter's tray that has some plates as well as this gentleman's head. It stems from a, from a kind of a 45 minute interview uh, that Josh did with him and he did with a series of other service industry workers about life and economics and, uh, and who they are as human beings. Uh, he then takes photographs and makes some 3D digital models uh, of, of the individuals as well as some of the ephemera or objects of their of their work, uh, which he then prints out uh, 3D printing uh, process on this kind of plastic. And uh, sorry, I just couldn't help but include this picture of my son on the show because anything that like, makes him actually like art, which is rare, uh, is, is a happy moment for me. Uh, and so here he is. And uh, that is the end of what I had to share with you from my end, but I'm really looking forward if there are any uh, questions or, or comments, hopefully you're still there. Hi, Benjamin. Thank you very, very much for that great uh, lecture. That was fantastic. Um, I just had a, a quick, just in relation to that, that last show that you curated, did, were you able to bring any of the artists? Um, presumably it was done during COVID. So you yeah, know, yeah, I should have given us about, it was done totally during COVID and I should say, it even was done uh, in, in, as a charity for BLM and some COVID charities out here. But no, so it was all right. done over email. We weren't really, didn't talk to any of them. And just randomly, I was in the gallery on Monday and someone knocked on the window and one of the artists was out here visiting a friend and was able to come in. Uh, but thus far, that was the only artist that could see the show. So it was all through, I mean, I'm pretty old school, so it was mostly text messages and phone calls. There were no Zooms. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I have a question, but I'm just going to uh, open it up first to see if anybody else has a, has a question for you. Anybody has a burning question for Benjamin? Well, just dive in then for a sec. Um, I was interested in a show that you curated, I think maybe about nine years ago, um, and it was called uh, Greater LA. And mm. obviously um, it was in relation to um, you know, the greater New York shows that have taken place in PS1 and so on. But as far as I understand from the show that you were really trying to position or, or make the point that um, Los Angeles, you know, wasn't a second city as it has been, you know, typecast or represented within the art world. And I know that you, it was reviewed um, by Roberta Smith, I think in the New York Times very favorably. Um, and I just wondered what kind of response did you get from the art community, from artists, from curators uh, in New York? Yeah, that's a really interesting and, and good question because it was a show that was, uh, that was exactly what the purpose was, uh, me and my, my two curators point. And I'm not sure if we got, I mean, we, to be honest, we didn't get a lot of pushback on that and I didn't have any in-depth in conversations. I think maybe we hit a certain moment where at least those that are inside the art world, uh, that are real active in this, the people that I would have gotten feedback from, had, had come to the similar realization um, uh, at, at about that time. I think the slightly larger world that's kind of just happening in the past maybe three or four years. Um, but, you know, I would argue that, you know, since 1975 or so, uh, or certainly 1980, uh, the center, at least of the creative output of the American art world is in Los Angeles. You would say it's the center. That's that's really great to um, hear. Yeah. 
Um, we have oh, a creation. And I, I mean, I, I could, this is like a cocktail conversation I have a lot, but just it's a combination of real estate costs and the, and the educational system there and the distance from the market. That might change now that there's more market activity in Los Angeles in terms of big galleries. But for so long, graduate students in New York from, say, Yale or a Columbia, they felt the market right there and their friends were getting shows and they felt the need. Whereas in Los Angeles, it really seemed like people were able to have the space to grow their practices, you know, for five or more years after they graduated from graduate school before the, the commercial conversation really happened. And, uh, and so I think um, certainly ideologically, the, the center was in, in Los Angeles. Yeah, and there was obviously a really great uh, relationship between um, Post Studio and uh, the art school system, as you just mentioned in LA, you know, um, given that um, the professors you know, at UCLA, Art Center, Cal Arts and so on, were also very integrated into the art world uh, and what we're showing, which I think had a lot to do with it. So um, we have a, a couple of questions coming in and there's one from uh, Amy Goddard-Smith and she's asking you, what are some of your favorite Los Angeles galleries? Um, my favorite Los Angeles galleries are um, David Kordansky and Blum and Poe are two of the load stars uh, for me. Uh, David's up here and a friend, we're about the same age and kind of grew up together. And Jeff and Tim, um, uh, for their faults have been kind of godfather-like uh, figures to me. And I think their program's very strong. And then also, I mean, Sean Regan is another person that's been like a, an important influential person in my life. Um, and then less, uh, you know, sort of, uh, Let's start off with Susan Veltlemmer, um, I think is an, an underappreciated in terms of how important she is and her ability to bridge really radical, politically radical art with a, with a, within the commercial system. I think she's, uh, yeah, I think, I think history will, will, will treat her kindly. Um, so I think those are my favorite of the, of the more, what I consider medium established. There's an older generation that isn't really for me. There's a lot of young people doing very cool stuff that I, even I, who's, you know, I'm based in New York, but I come to Los Angeles probably four times a year, have trouble keeping up with um, bouncing around east side. But certainly um, uh, uh, people like Hannah Hoffman, who has kind of an iterant gallery is, uh, I, I think, really interesting to me. Um, uh, the folks at Francois Gabaldi uh, are people that I do a lot of work. In fact, I think uh, we have a Pitzer alumni who, uh, who shows on their roster. Um, and uh, I'm blanking on and, uh, and Night Gallery. Um, but even now, these are, these are all galleries that are sort of middle-aged. There's a whole other generation, you know, post those that, 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 that exist that, that, that pop in and out of my consciousness. But yeah, those are the, one, the main ones for me. Great, thanks a lot. And we have a question actually from Brandon. Um, Brandon, do you want to ask the question yourself? Okay, I'll, yeah, please go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, I just had a quick question. So as a curator, what was perhaps one of the most interesting installations you've ever done over the course of your career? I mean, you know, it, 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 it kind of, uh, it varies. I mean, I've, I've like done absurd things. One of the great parts about art, it's hard to talk in a moment of pandemic, is the absurd aims we go to just on a physical level to move large objects up into tall buildings, stuff like that, <laughs> carry things upstairs. I mean, buy all sorts of strange objects for an artist. Um, and uh, and yeah, for me, that's always one of the fun times it's, it's something important to me about art because there's something in that absurdity and doing something that has no real use value. Uh, a lot of the things I trade with have an economic value, but there's no real use value. And that this kind of uh, using the the excess, the kind of the, the the surplus that the friction of capitalism has created, or the inefficiencies has created to do things. Um, so some of the favorite is I worked with an artist uh, based at the time in Beijing and Shanghai, uh, who's actually a magazine uh, 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 publisher and architect uh, uh, called Zhang Zhu, uh, and uh, and he just had all these amazing things that were considered kind of vernacularly um, absurd things uh, from different hotongs and, and older sections of China uh, uh, that people kind of use to create possibilities for themselves. And so we shipped all these crazy, you know, uh, water spouts that had certain locks on them so only certain families could use them. Um, they've been created by the local community. Um, and, you know, bicycles that have been modified for certain uses and things like that. And just kind of like getting that through customs and up on a wall was crazy. And then um, there's a couple of occasions that I work in a location that's about 22 stories tall with very small elevators. And I've worked with the most brilliant uh, and graceful art installers to carry very valuable, very large objects up that. And just watching them work uh, is, for me, at least always a pleasure. That's awesome, thank you. And then we have a question from Wilhelmina Tax. Um, and Wilhelmina asks, how did you get into your current career? 
I mean, by a, a lot of mistakes and false starts uh, and productive failures um, and a, a fair amount, uh, uh, must be said, of the, of the privilege of kind of looking the way that I do and speaking the way I do. Um, but it really, a lot of it comes down to, and, and it's a self-serving answer for the context, but to Pitzer, um, to allowing my interests to kind of be really varied and across multiple disciplines. And, uh, and, 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 and one of those was visual culture, but I, didn't, I studied media studies, I studied film and television, um, but also took a lot of politics and sociology classes and, and studied how the world worked. And, and for me, outside of food, which is another great passion, art is one of the few microwaves to create immediate change in the world because the ability of, of creating objects and putting them in space and controlling um, or, or kind of working on how those objects exist in space when people view them, their subjectivities change, how they view the world is kind of subtly perhaps and, and even imperceptibly is affected by, by those objects existing and that changes them as a being. So I think a lot of the lessons I learned at Pitzer made me want to do something that had real uh, significant change in the world. Um, the visual arts were one of those things. So everything past that in terms of the actual jobs and stuff, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's less important than the core idea of what I wanted to do in terms of not a job, but kind of the change I wanted to make in the world. Thank you for that. And then we have, we have another question. I'm not sure who this is from. Um, and this is a question. You mentioned the unsustainable activities that drive the art market. Do you see any way to alter that? And how do the collectors think about this issue? Um, that's a really good question, one that's hard to answer, um, because despite, as I said before, being a half glass half full sort of guy, I'm not certain that there will ever be a real collective will. Um, the things that tend to, uh, you know, the things that have ecological damage, the moving people and objects around, are also what kind of draw drives a lot of the economics of the situation. Um, and so despite a lot of people, myself included, uh, playing lip service to this at the end of the day, until there, until there's a lack of economic incentive for these things to transpire, I'm not sure if uh, if people change things. That being said, I do have a lot of uh, on the small things. I do have a lot of or several collectors that we think about things like I showed you a picture at the very end of my slideshow of a big wooden crate uh, that was being tossed in a dumpster, and that that wasn't mine. Uh, we do our best to recycle things like that and to reuse them. Um, they're tremendously expensive, but that's kind of that's really just kind of uh, nibbling around the edges. Um, uh, the systematic change, other than several artists uh, and a couple of galleries, I will say, and, uh, have, have, have engaged in ensuring, and I can think of Peter Halley as one artist as an example, he calculates the exact carbon uh, kind of output of his studio every year, including the shipping of objects to different places, and buys offsets against that. But that's the only, really, one of the few concrete um, acts of change that I've seen. Thank you, Benjamin. And then we have a question from Professor Tim Berg. Hey, thank you. Um, so I was thinking about the kind of somatic experience of art as you were talking, and I really appreciate appreciated that example you gave of touching the bronze sculpture and feeling the coldness of it and how important that is. Um, and thinking about like the artworks that my wife and I make and put out into the world. And as artists, that stuff is really important to us. And I feel like a lot of the things you showed, what's kind of interesting about them is I think they work visually really well. And I think people would be attracted to them visually and conceptually when you describe them, but that they also can work in that somatic way. And I'm just wondering, like, wh what are we losing uh, or what are we gaining or it just feels like not having all of the senses engaged in, in especially some types of art. Um, and are those, no, I think, I think all, I think all types, I mean, not to cut you off, but, um, yeah. no, it sucks. I'm, I'm not sure if my, if my, my quick speaking and kind of glancing over it really allowed to sink in. I don't like any of those experiences. Um, and I'm not sure if anyone does. Um, and even just a, a painting, um, you know, just the, the feel, what the actual scale is, uh, could be me and I'm a little bit like 
brain damage. But you know, if even if I read the size of something and still I, until I stand in front of it, I have no no notion of what the scale is in relationship to my human body. And certainly things like ceramics. I think you're a ceramicist, you and your wife, as I recall. Um, you know, the touch, the feel. But you know, the, the sculpture, just the 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 physical volume of how you, how your body relates to it in space. Um, so a ton has been lost, and I've seen nothing. And I've investigated doing some VR stuff for clients. Um, and uh, nothing I've seen approaches it um, at all. But I will say on the other hand, especially some of the higher end galleries, I, I, I sent, I showed that one, uh, the one example of Kerry James Marshall, the amount of intellectual uh, uh, information uh, that they can put out. And some of it's quite well done, um, uh, really vastly surpasses what I would normally engage in with some sales director or, or even the artist walking me through the show. Um, and the ability to read and see things and look at videos of them. Um, so if you have the time and patience, there can be some, I mean, that's the benefit, but I mean, everything else is, is, is a total bummer. Do we have uh, another, is there another question? Is, I, I'm not quite sure if this is, uh, Chris, did you just send me another question to read out or, or not? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So there's a question um, about the most highly ranked art schools tend to function as um, grounds for graduates to audition for getting uh, picked up by the most exclusive galleries. This also drives museum acquisitions indirectly. These trends effectively lock many artists out of the top tier of recognition. What would you recommend for emerging artists for challenging that system? And that's from William Parida. Thank you for that great question. Yeah, I mean, well, a lot of my friends have gone to art school. It seems like the time that that bought at least um, has been valuable. Um, you know, it's a, a, in terms of the economics of it, it's an absolute, you know, disaster. Um, and I'm not sure if that's what William's getting at, but I mean, you know, people uh, exiting school saddled in student loan debt um, and at the, at the hope, and even though these schools may seem to exist as feeders for the elite galleries, I mean, still very few of the artists that graduate from these schools will find positions, uh, will find, uh, will, will be able to show at those galleries, or even mid-tier galleries, or even small galleries, and the work that will be sold will be very hard to economically justify um, the cost of that. Um, but I'm not, even, so, so I'm not even sure if they're actually feeders. Um, and, and to fight against that, I, I, I think in, in, in all things right now, the only, the only way to, or not in all things, at least in this thing, the only way to fight against it is to create new models and to create new spaces and to do apartment shows. I think, you know, um, you know, I was never that much into the musical punk rock. But I think the ethos of doing it yourself and creality is uh, is perhaps one of the only valued ways to move forward. I'm not sure if there's a way to, to, to try and exist in the system. I mean, that said, you know, there are a lot of galleries that show, uh, a lot of artists that show without going to graduate school. So I think even if the, even if the commercial system is one that for whatever reason might appeal to you, um, you know, the, I don't think the, 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 the impertoire of graduate school, and certainly not the, the student debt and genders, is necessary for that function. And we have a question from uh, Professor Bill Anthes. If you'd like to go ahead, Bill. Hey, Benjamin. Thank you for your time and your talk today. Um, you showed a couple uh, works like the, the, the Hood by David Hammonds, and you were talking about the ways in which artists have been addressing the things that we're addressing as a society, you know, in a very urgent way this summer. Not, not to cut you off, but it was, it was more things, that, artwork that made me think of what we were addressing. That I'm not sure, I wouldn't put that on the artist to be addressing. Right, right, right. Although I think Hannah yeah. um, But yeah, 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 for sure. I'm wondering if you have gotten an inkling yet that some of the kind of top tier collectors are beginning to think about how to pivot and um, uh, take, this, take this kind of new moment into account. Yeah, I mean, it's something I've been thinking a lot about, and I, I, I hate to sort of defend this because I'm not sure if it's true, but one thing we saw over the past three or four years are traditionally marginalized people, uh, people that make work that just marginalized, actually the, their commercial value rise, at least in kind of high big uh, auction things. And is that a leading indicator or is that just like the ultimate capitalist, like finding assets that are undervalued, and re but perhaps reading the room and pre-reading the room. 
So I wonder if there's a sense that that wasn't uh, 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 an early indicator of certain fundamental societal changes that were underfoot. Um, and also, I mean, I think the best model is Aggie Gund, who is a long time uh, chair of the board Museum of Modern Art, and is now the Emeritus Chair, uh, and a, a great supporter of art and artists and institutions, but like old school New York society uh, in her way. Um, uh, one of the best dressed women I've ever, I've, I've, I've ever met. And she uh, decided to sell off some of the more highly valued works from her collection. Uh, and I think it added up something around $50 million. Uh, and that all went to grants for social justice. This happened before um, certain recent things. So, I mean, that's certainly a model. And I've definitely had conversations uh, with collectors about the present moment and what they think. And one of the great things about the way I work is that most of these collectors become really close friends of mine and they're they're happy to share and they come from very different positions than I do in a lot of other ways. Um, but I think people uh, are certainly, if not wondering what they can do with their art activities, are certainly, uh, and, and, and I'm talking about people that really are, you know, hardcore industrialists, um, uh, you know, have really been thinking about a world and privilege in a way that they hadn't been before. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's been, it's been a very interesting time because of that. I think my position uh, in able team, but yeah, certainly those, those three things are separate, but I think related. And I think Aggie would be in this regard that I can think of. Thanks. Um, then we have a question from Alexandra Dorada, who says, you showed an article on how artists are moving closer to art collectors. Do you think architecture should be adapted for this this type of situation? And if so, how? Yeah, I mean, the article I was, I know, speaking a bit fast, it was more about how art galleries, so the artists themselves uh, generally aren't moving out here, but it's just a very kind of high end uh, vacation area, and it's a lot of the galleries. Um, so I'm not sure how architecture would respond to that. I mean, I will say, um, you know, are, Architects like art advisors in a way kind of tend to follow and art dealers tend to follow where the money goes at least physically. Um, so, you know, for good or ill, we're not sure exactly how architecture as a practice can kind of respond um, in, in any way off the top of my head anyway. So I just wanted to touch on something um, that you talked about very, at the very beginning um, about the relationship or the differences between, you know, Los Angeles and, and New York art scene. Um, and how you, um, you mentioned that, uh, you know, so many more uh, high-end commercial galleries are opening up in LA um, or having, you know, second galleries in LA and suggesting that this perhaps may alter that very special position that LA had as one of these sites where artists could have um, large studios and plenty of time to develop their practice. And now of course, as a result of gentrification and more and more galleries moving downtown and, and elsewhere in LA, that it's much harder for artists to actually survive and get a studio. Do you see that in your traveling around and visiting studios and going to art fairs? Do you see the impact of that, of the impact of gentrification and LA becoming a really prominent art center? Do you see that impact manifesting in the artworks itself that you are looking at? Are they becoming more commercial now? That's a, that's a hard question, and partially because I don't spend as much time in younger artist studios as I once did in my career, um, sadly, as I, as I think on it. So I wouldn't much sure if I'd be the best person to have seen that. But we'll, what I will say is that I've noticed that, you know, LA is more expensive for artists, and, and that pushes them to further develop new places, which, you know, um, you know artists are often at the avant-garde of gentrification property-wise, um, and we've seen certain um, frictions that engenders uh, in the Los Angeles area over the past several years. And, you know, uh, again, being a half glass full guy, I mean, New York's about to go through its worst financial position as a metropolitan, uh, as a metropolitan space since the 1970s. And uh, I, I hear from, uh, because I'm a middle-aged guy with kids, uh, I have friends that aren't in the art world uh, uh, through my children. And there's a lot of people leaving, uh, the type of middle-class families that really kind of made New York kind of packed and, and one would argue kind of, uh, not middle class, upper middle class, kind of pushed out uh, a lot of the avant-garde from downtown New York, became such a, a safe place uh, for people to be. Um, and so, well, Benjamin is sad that 
pain that New York will go through, especially as it relates to social services and education, other things. My one small hope is that uh, any hardship could create the, uh, you know, the, the still sense where it's a place a young person, be they a dancer, a performer, uh, a visual artist, a, a theater, uh, a playwright, um, or just a bon vivant to come to again, because it was losing that. Um, I've only lived here for about 20 years, but certainly over the past five to 10 years, um, it's been losing that sheen. So um, I know your question was about Los Angeles, but I can only think of it uh, in relationship to New York. Maybe these things, if not cyclical, are pendulums that swing one way or another, or perhaps new art communities will be formed in, um, you know, uh, in, in, in New Orleans and, and Nashville and other places that uh, potentially, um, you know, have been, uh, uh, you know, have, have an, still have a relatively low cost of living. That's a very, that's, a, that's an excellent answer. And are you seeing that though? Are you seeing that more and more artists that are leaving New York, leaving LA and moving to uh, cities that actually have no kind of art profile whatsoever, high art profile? I mean, I, you know, because of where, where I sit, I, like, I'm not sure about younger artists, I'm sure that's happening, but I've seen even moderately successful artists, but I mean, success is a, is a, is a continuum. Someone can seem quite successful, you know, be on the roster of a gallery that shows in the big fairs and have shows every three years. But um, it's not always, a, a, you know, it's not always a feasible, a financially feasible to still stay in New York, given that. So I've seen a lot of people move outside, especially once they've built connections um, within, within the city and find um, cheaper places to live or just better places uh, to raise a family or to live the kind of lifestyle that they want. Thank you very much, Benjamin. Um, does anybody else have a question before we uh, finish for today? Any last thoughts? If not, perhaps Benjamin, you could tell us um, what you're doing in the very near future and uh, whether you're curating any more shows or what's what's happening. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, in the future, I'm, I'm, I'm staying right here. I'm not going anywhere. And I don't think there will be anywhere to go uh, for the rest of, of this year, certainly for me. Um, but I do uh, I'm working with a friend who just moved to an important modernist house. And of course, I forget the name of the architect uh, in just on the outskirts of New Haven. And we're working on a show of Carlo Molino and uh, Robert Maplethorpe photographs uh, in tandem with, uh, he's, a, he's, a he's an artist, but he's also a collector and dealer in modern furniture. So it'll be a combination show of furniture and photography and I'm working uh, with a health resort, uh, kind of a, a big old school spa uh, outside uh, Kassel, Germany to do a show of outdoor sculpture that will take place concurrently with Documenta in two years. I'm sorry, I have to push you more on that. Tell me more about the show in Kassel. Uh, it, it's not in Kassel, it, it's, I, I, I will mispronounce the name if I try right now. Uh, but it's a it's a great kind of water cure spa that, that dates back to the 17th century and it has some of the first English planted gardens on the continent uh, that were planted in the very middle of the 18th century. And so I'm working with a uh, with a commercial enterprise to bring uh, to bring some large scale outdoor uh, uh, sculpture there and just notion that there will be people in the area. It's a people. It's an old. Um, a very old family from that portion of Germany. And as I was driving through from Kassel to Munster, Kassel is a, a, a decades old art show that happens every five years. Uh, and, uh, and Munster is, a, is a, a show that happens every 10 or something ridiculous years fairly nearby. And I was driving through with a friend. And we stopped there for lunch and got to talk to the proprietors. And it's just the most amazing, beautiful landscape. And so we thought it might be interesting to try and, uh, to try and use those gardens for things. That's very exciting. I'll have to go there uh, next time. Well, when is the, the next document is what, 2024, is it? Or is it? And that'll be in 2022. Oh, 2022, okay. Um, so if this, does anybody 2022. else have, yeah. yeah. Anybody else has anything they'd like to say just before we end? Uh, and if not, um, thank you very, very much for spending all this time with us today and for the great conversation. It's been really, really fabulous. Um, and we hope that you'll come visit us again soon. Thank you. Thank you. That was so fun. Thanks, guys. Bye.